Hello friends. Have you ever done this thought experiment where you attempt to remember back to what it felt like when you were first born? To try to get in the frame of mind and the frame of feeling of, in essence, your original self before all of the distractions and challenges and traumas and uh, beliefs and desires of our life have covered over that essential original self. Or as my Reiki teacher puts it, have you ever tried to remember the wholeness of your true self? Well, one of the things that I absolutely love about teaching the system of Reiki is that it provides a really beautiful and elegant uh, answer to this question and a pathway for helping us to find that answer for ourselves. But long before I was practicing and teaching the system of Reiki from its Japanese origins, I was wrestling with this question and finding a beautiful and elegant answer from a different source. Friends, welcome back to Heartscapes, where we play at the intersection of self-reflection, spiritual practice, and social action. I'm really glad you've decided to join me for today's leg of the journey. This inquiry began for me about seven or eight years ago when I was in a really miserable time and in a place where uh, the possibility of remembering anything like the wholeness of my true self was absolutely unattainable. And furthermore, the possibility of even just feeling happy on any kind of regular basis was not attainable. And in that state of mind, I encountered a new idea, a new concept that I had never considered before. It was came in the form of a quote from a speaker who was uh, speaking at a local church and about the intersections between spirituality and social justice and the importance of finding that sweet spot, that sweet overlapping place where our gifts and talents and passions, the things that light us up, you know, meet the world's need. And he began talking about joy, about the experience of joy and the ability for us to experience joy, even in the midst of great suffering. Again, a new idea for me at that time. And the quote that stuck with me was something like, this is probably a paraphrase, but something like, joy is happiness that does not depend on what is happening. In other words, it's some sort of innate state that we have that is not influenced or degraded by the experiences that we're having, by the negative feelings that we're having, by abuses we're experiencing, or by anything else that might be coming in at us from the external world, or even things that might be going on in our internal space that are covering up that innate sense of joy. Well, again, this was a new thought for me, and it's one that I began to really turn over as I was in the midst of this miserable time. The idea that even in the middle of this, I could tap into something like joy felt like just profoundly valuable medicine. And I began working with it through the practice that I had at the time, which was called soul collage. And that was a really wonderful and eye-opening experience. A short time later, I encountered something that changed my life. It was a book that took this idea of joy as happiness that does not depend on what happens around us to a much, much deeper, more profound level. And right now we're in the about the five year anniversary of this book coming out. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time with it to reinvestigate it for myself and to share a bit of what it has given me with all of you. The book I'm speaking of, you might have already guessed, is the book of joy a book that documents a historic amazing and unique meeting of minds that occurred in 2015 between the archbishop desmond tutu of south africa and the dalai lama of tibet these two men are great friends soul brothers of each other deep 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 love and affection for each other an incredible kinship of mind and heart despite coming from different religious and cultural perspectives and traditions. But because of the circumstances of their lives, the, the busyness, 
the uh, profound impacts on how they need to spend their time, of course, the distance between them, and the political restrictions that have been placed on travel by the Dalai Lama by the ongoing conflict between Tibet and China. It had been impossible for the two of them to spend much actual physical time together. In fact, I, I might be right in saying that at the time that this um, project was put together, they'd really only spent time together in the context of the Nobel Peace Prizes that they had both received and the time spent um, around the Nobel Laureate Committee. And so it was an incredible opportunity, not only for the two of them as soul brothers, to come together and spend this time, what ended up being four days together. But for that time to be spent in mining and gathering wisdom collected from these two profoundly influential, compassionate, and deeply gifted spiritual leaders around something that was of great importance to the world. And it's fascinating to me that what they decided on, what they centered on, when they asked, what should we focus our conversation on in this time, was joy, was the universal pursuit of happiness that humans experience as part of our journey through our lives and our physical, social bodies. And so they put out to the world the question of what do you want to know from these two men about joy, about what joy is, how it functions in our life, and most importantly, how do we cultivate it? How do we get to that state where we have access to that reservoir of joy, that deep, incredible pool of resources and nourishment that can sustain us through difficulty? How do we access that even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of oppression, even in the midst of depression and all of the many distractions that we experience? How do we retain it? How do we move from the fleeting experience of happiness to the deep and abiding experience of joy? And this book provides some really amazing answers to that question, documented over these four days that these men spent together and compiled really, really brilliantly into this book by um, Douglas Abrams, who is one of the archbishop's biographers. One of the things that's really beautiful and that has uh, kept me coming back to this resource and, and really is the reason why this book changed my life rather than being um, you know, simply something that I read and found interesting and then moved on from, is the simplicity of what is presented. There's incredible depth in the research uh, that was done around joy and the responses to the questions that were submitted, incredible spiritual, intellectual, and emotional depth is presented. But when it comes down to it, what it actually takes for us to remain connected to that deep reservoir of nourishing joy that we do carry with us at all times are very simple practices. Simple, but not necessarily easy, right? Because it takes diligence, it takes consistent practice. It requires us to remember to draw on the practices when we are in times of distress, which can be unexpectedly difficult. But again, at its core, what it really takes for us to live a life of joy is simple. When I began to study and practice Reiki from its Japanese origins, I had a similar response. That this system is profound, it's deep, and it's simple. It's accessible. It just requires us to engage it diligently. And as I worked through that practice and began sharing that practice with all of you in various spaces, I more and more saw the kinship between the practice of Reiki from its Japanese origins and what's presented in the Book of Joy. So much of it centering on the relationship between joy and compassion, between joy and generosity, between joy and connection with ourselves, with others, 
with the world around us, with the unseen. And I began to really look more carefully at those connections. Of course, there's some obvious ones. The Dalai Lama is the leader of Tibetan Buddhism and esoteric Japanese Buddhism is one of the primary roots of the system of Reiki from its origins. So there's some, you know, philosophical and practical important connections there. And also there's a way in which what's presented in this book is tapping into some universal truths, some truths that come forward in many traditions as evidenced by how much kinship there is with the Anglican Christianity that is practiced by the Archbishop, the beautiful synchronicities and some really interesting differences between them and the dialogue between these two as they explore those connections and those differences is both profound and often hilarious in the way that it comes through. So I have been once again walking with this material um, perhaps because it is the five-year anniversary this year of this work being published. Um, perhaps it is the season as we are working through fall and moving towards winter. Um, I know winter is a time when it can sometimes be difficult to access that reservoir of joy. And so it just came to my heart to um, not only work through this book again uh, for myself, but to share it with all of you in a couple of different ways. Firstly is here in this space. I'll be making a, a series of videos, at least a couple more um, on this topic, walking through certain things that um, really stand out to me from this book, the things that I've really put into practice and sharing some practices with you that you can take into your life. Secondly, I've decided to make the Book of Joy the focus of this season's seasonal 21 day Reiki practice. So each season, and the 21 days leading up into the equinox or the solstice. Um, I host a daily practice circle for half an hour um, focused on a particular theme, a particular learning, a particular element um, of the system of Reiki or that has informed the system of Reiki. And we just open that practice space for half an hour every day. Folks are welcome to drop in um, for as many of those as they can um, or would like. Uh, it's just an open space of practice. And in this case, we'll be really digging into the learnings um, from this book that are focused on the eight obstacles to joy, eight obstacles that all of us experience at some point that get in the way of accessing our joy, and the eight pillars of joy, the eight things that um, these two brilliant minds have um, noticed and have developed an understanding for that when practiced and put into effect in our life can give us access to that reservoir of joy at all times. So we'll be working with those things, um, both in terms of ideas and in terms of practice. So I invite you all to come along on this journey for as much of it as you like. Uh, if you are not yet subscribed to this channel, I invite you to do so and hit notifications so that you will know when new uh, videos get uploaded on this topic and many others related to exploring the ways in which the system of Reiki can come alive and well and robustly into our lives in ways that make us more of who we are that make us better. And I will also put down in the show notes uh, for this video a link to information about the 21 day practice if anybody would like to drop in and join us for any of that. And until we gather again on this topic, I just want to close with a quote from the book, uh, which so beautifully mirrored that first quote that so touched my heart in that time of challenge and difficulty about the difference between joy and happiness. The Archbishop put it, puts it this way. Joy is much bigger than happiness. While happiness is often seen as being dependent on external circumstances, joy is not. He goes on to say that joy is our essential nature, something everyone can realize. We could say that our desire for happiness is, in a way, an attempt to rediscover our original state of mind. So when we return to that thought experiment, have we ever tried to remember 
what it was like to be our first original self when we were first born. It turns out there's a pathway for doing that. And we're going to walk a little bit of it this month. I hope you'll choose to join me. And in the meantime, may you be deeply provisioned for your journey wherever it takes you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.